Following the global rollout of vaccines, that's COVID-19 vaccines, governments all over the world gradually relaxed restrictions and life as we knew it started getting back to normal. However, recent rise in cases of COVID-19 in several countries, especially Brazil, India and Turkey, with high fatality rates and prevalence of new variants, raised concerns on how to protect Nigeria from this resurgence. As a precautionary measure, the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 placed travel restrictions on Brazil, India and Turkey because of high records or uh, incidence of uh, cases. Just yesterday, in what many have described as a shock move, the Presidential Steering Committee reinstituted restriction of movements with a nationwide curfew imposed from 12 midnight to 4 a.m starting from tonight to 11th July when the guidelines will be reviewed. Now this is given the significant reduction in cases across the country. So the implementation guidelines also placed restrictions on gatherings and operations of businesses and government offices. Now what are the ramifications of these restrictions? Why is it likely or what is the likely impact on the economy? Our guest on Nigeria Today will be providing answers to these and other questions. Welcome to the program. I'm Victor Azu. Now with me in the studio to discuss reinstitution of COVID-19 restrictions is Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed. Technical Head, Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 and National Incident Manager. Welcome to the program. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me, Victor. Now let's take it uh, off <coughs> straight away. There has been some confusion on what exactly uh, the steering committee announced with regards to the curfew. Are we in a lockdown? So straight away, I will tell you we are not in, in a lockdown. Um, and these measures that we announced yesterday are not entirely new measures. These are measures that have been on ground uh, since March uh, this year. And um, there are measures that have been taken uh, even before we started seeing the rising cases in India, Brazil and Turkey. These measures are part of our uh, phase three of the uh, ease of lockdown. Uh, and now what we have done is just to reissue the same guidance they are not new. It is the same guidance that we have reinstated, we have reissued, just to wake up our people to understand that there is still the possibility and a very high risk of having a third wave of COVID-19. And these measures are meant you know, to reduce that risk and to help us uh, return to normal. Now, from every indication, there is no spike in cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria. And already there are travel, uh, travel restrictions for countries with high indices of COVID-19. So what is the rationale behind restating these restrictions? You have just said uh, it has to do with uh, just creating a kind of sensitization. But beyond that, is there a strong reason for this now? It is not just only sensitization, but it is the science and the fact behind it. Um, if you look at the data, the internal data we have uh, for Nigeria, yes, we have not been recording a high number of cases. But this is because we are not testing optimally. Uh, our people, particularly in the states, testing are not being carried out. Um, the only testing that is uh, done, which is the mandatory travel testing, that is the one that is most uh, prevalent. And if you look at it also, so it's not only the number, but also the type of, of strain that we have. These Indian variants we are talking about, we have identified it in Nigeria now. And only yesterday, the WHO announced that this Indian variant is now a variant of international concern. And we know that this Indian variant has very high uh, transmission rate. It is more uh, highly transmissible and it is even more virulent than the other strains. Therefore, it will very soon, you know, overtake, you know, the other strains in the country. It will become the dominant strain and it will spread faster. Now, in order to avoid that, that is why we have to re-emphasize these um, uh, restriction measures in the society. Now, is there... Is that supposed to be with uh, the restrictions internally 
or with the restriction placed on Turkey, India, and the Brazil, because there is a rollout of uh, COVID-19 vaccines at the moment, one would have thought that uh, with the discovery and subsequent uh, consequent vaccination going on around the country, that uh, we could uh, be a little bit easier on our people, especially with the restrictions. So let me uh, explain uh, a little. There are three factors here that are very important. Um, number one is the rising number of cases globally. You know, in a pandemic, it is called pandemic because it is all over the world. The world so when one part of the world is not safe, any other part of the world is also not safe. We have seen the cases rising in India, in Nepal, uh, in Pakistan, We've seen it in Brazil, in Argentina, in Peru. We have seen, despite vaccination, many countries, even in Europe, uh, the number of cases continue to rise. So that is an indication that we are not completely immune from having this uh, third wave or a reinfection or, uh, of, of uh, the COVID-19. Secondly, it is true that vaccinations have been rolled out. And these vaccinations are meant to reduce uh, drastically you know, the rate of transmission in a society if you are able to vaccinate a large number of your population. But what has happened so far is that there is a kind of a global scarcity of the vaccines mm. because many countries are now looking for doses to vaccinate their own people. India, that is the largest producer of vaccines in the world, went into this problem. And therefore, India had to now look into its own internal needs to provide its own population with the vaccines. And therefore, there are needs on the agreement of providing the rest of the world, you know, with uh, the vaccines. vaccines. They have indeed. to provide to their own population. The third factor is, you know, the lull or the uh, loss of guard that has occurred. Um, in many countries, if you take India, for example, we believe that is the same issue that has happened. Because they see that the vaccines are being rolled out, because the number of cases are reducing, India relaxed its guards. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, people were not wearing masks, there was no enforcement measures, there was a lot of gatherings, political, religious, and before you know it, you know what was a very low uh, profile country in terms of COVID-19 became now the epicenter you know, of, of the whole world. They are recording thousands of, hundreds of thousands of cases a day and thousands of deaths. So we look at Nigeria's situation. Nigeria is not in any different condition than India has been about a month ago. Um, Nigeria, we have also noted that we have lost our guard. We have, uh, we are not careful in wearing our face mask. Gatherings have continued to occur. Uh, compliance and enforcement are no longer in place. People are going about their own businesses. And just like you mentioned, with the advent of the vaccine, actually everybody felt the attention should be on the vaccine and we should just relax and make sure that we vaccinate everyone. So the situation in Nigeria now is ripe. It is akin to what India was about a month ago. And we fear, honest fear, and also with facts that really and the this, situation may change. Exactly, the situation can change any time and we are at the risk of having a third wave. Right, now, now the, the restrictions, you know, says government workers from grade level 12 and below uh, should be working from home. This has been there for quite uh, some time uh, in the previous phases of COVID-19 restrictions. How effective or impactful has that been? So, um, just you are reiterating the fact that this is not a new guidance we have provided. We know that GL Level 12 have been at home for uh, almost a year plus now, uh, not reporting to us since we'd had the first lockdown. And the impact of this is that you have reduced the uh, number of people occupying uh, office spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly in, in federal government offices, in, in federal secretariat, you find so many people, you know, sitting in one small office, you know, having to uh, interact and discuss and eat uh, together. And, and that is causing a lot of... of um, but but that's the point. Are they working from home? That's the issue. Have they not been going to work, really, for all this time? So, by our guideline, uh, you know, they are not supposed to be coming to work. But we know, we are aware, we've had uh, some incidences where reports have reached us that um, some grade level 12 or below in some agencies 
or in some ministries have been asked to come and we quickly intervene and um, we uh, bring them back to order and remind mm -hmm. them that these staff are not uh, supposed to come. We know also that unofficially some of these staff, uh, especially the lower level staff, have to come to the office because that is where they, they get some uh, kind of their livelihood also, uh, you know, to complement their earnings. All right. Uh, the, the new guideline also imposed a nationwide curfew of 12 midnight to 4 a.m. starting from tonight. Now, these are already we hours. Again, how significant is this measure? Now, you see, these are uh, small areas, you know, but actually they have a very big impact. Now, if you look at, so you will ask normally, what proportion of our people go out between 12 and 4 a.m.? You know, you and me, we are at home, you know, long before that time, and we don't come out till after, well, well uh, many hours after 4 o'clock. So, but the small number of people who have activities in that night are the people who go to nightclubs, are the people who go to uh, pubs. And you know the kind of interaction in those places. People are close to each other. Uh, you probably shout, uh, discuss, and you transmit, you know, the virus. And then the same people now come back to their families or to the community, mm -hmm. and they continue to spread it. So there are small uh, proportion of people, but it has a large epidemiological impact in terms of transmission. All right, Dr. Mukhtar Mohamed, let's pause for a break and um, get to hear what Nigerians think of this latest development. Nigeria Today will return shortly. in the news about what's happening in, in India and in some other places in the world. Uh, I'm sure the, the, the measures they are taking is to safeguard, to safeguard the, the country, its citizens. I don't think they should restrict anybody because the country we are already facing difficulties. In so many things, prices are very high. I support what the uh, COVID-19 Typhus Committee is doing, Presidential Committee is doing. Because many Nigerians are neglecting the uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine that is going on, that uh, they don't trust it or whatever. They don't think uh, there's any sincerity about this now. If truly what they are saying, that the vaccine they give to people is to improve and to have more lives safe, and uh, up to now is still increasing. It's a welcome uh, uh, decision from the authority. And uh, at least we, we've experienced it before. It's not the first time. At least we will adhere to it. Nobody wearing their nose mask. So it is, it, it, is, as in, it is so serious that we all are feeling so relaxed right now. We think it has actually died, but it is not yet dead. It is still real. Well, welcome back. If you've just tuned in, you are still on time, and uh, we have been discussing reinstitution of COVID-19 restrictions with Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed, Technical Head Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, and National Incident Manager. Doc, mixed reactions there. Some say, well, we don't need any of this hardship, and others say, well, we think uh, we need to do that. What is the place of enlightenment in all of this? So I, I'm glad the viewers has expressed uh, views that I believe uh, perhaps reflect, um, you know, what the society thinks. Um, and really these measures are not meant to be a serious country will consider at this point. national flights. What we did was we focus on the passengers and we try to uh, reduce or mitigate the risk that uh, they bring. So the role of um, communication is very important. Enlightenment is also very important. Uh, people have to understand that they have to be responsible enough to protect themselves and also protect uh, their family. Like one of the uh, participants mentioned, 
um, you know, regarding our vaccine coverage. Yes, yes we've started the vaccine uh, rollout, but how many people have been vaccinated? We are just talking about 1.2 million, 1.3 million out Nigerians. Of an estimated out of that so that is 0.5 percent, mm. you know, of our population. So we have not gone anywhere in terms of vaccination, and the vaccines now are difficult to reach. We are making every effort to make sure that we secure enough doses for Nigeria. Uh, there are several high-powered delegations and discussions going on now. Um, you know, between countries and between Nigeria and also the manufacturers to ensure that we secure these this doses. But we are, we are not yet there. And that is why these uh, preventive measures are the best measures that we can adopt at this point in time. But then, I, I wonder, those who have had their first jobs, is the second dose available? Given... Yeah you know, what you are talking about now, scarcity of vaccines. So if you recall, Victor, uh, Nigeria got about 4 million doses of this vaccine. Mm -hmm. And like I told you now, uh, the current data shows that we have only vaccinated about 1.2, 1.3 million. So certainly we have enough doses for the, go, second, the second to go around for the same people who have received their, their first uh, jab of the vaccine. And at the right time. At the right time, yes. Now, there, there is approval for gathering of a maximum of 50 persons in enclosed spaces for weddings and funerals. Restaurants are also allowed to operate at 50% capacity. Why are event centers, bars, and nightclubs closed totally to further notice? And while you know, religious centers, worship centers are allowed to roam free. So uh, the religious centers are not allowed to roam uh, free. If you read the guideline, we also said that they should uh, operate within 50% uh, capacity, just like we mentioned for, for restaurants. The whole idea is to make sure that um, we reduced the congestion in these places because it's when people are very close to each other, you are within 1.5 meters distance uh, of someone that you will be able to transmit the dro droplet, you know, for him to inhale and uh, get infected. So why did we ban bars and pubs and uh, nightclubs? Now the interaction in pubs, nightclubs, you know that it is uh, very close and there is no social distancing. You will have a space in a nightclub, uh, you know, that normally should be for 20 people, but you'll find maybe nearly 50 or 100 people you know, seated there. So these are, and in those places, there is a lot of other activities, maybe smoking, uh, a little uh, binge or intoxication going on, uh, and therefore people will definitely lose their guts. Mm -hmm. And in those places, people don't wear face masks. You cannot have social distancing. So it is only uh, logical, you know, that such places are, uh, uh, we've also banned uh, indoor sports, if you look at it. So the indoor sports, if you look at it also, it's places where people might probably, uh, particularly the contact, uh, you know, games, where people will now be close to each other, there will be a lot of sweating, there will be high breathing, and you know, this virus comes out, the higher the force of your breathing, the higher the chance that, you know, you breathe it out for someone else to, to inhale. We have allowed outdoor uh, non-contact sports to continue. We have mentioned sports like tennis, uh, like mm -hmm. golf, because these are done out in the open and usually there is no congestion uh, of people playing uh, golf or people playing uh, tennis, you know, while in, in the open. So these are some of the considerations that actually underlie uh, the, the guidelines that have been reissued. Now, you talked about sports, contact sports. I know that football is a contact sport. And I do know that the Nigeria Professional Football League just resumed uh, the second half of the season, just at the weekend. So does this guideline put a stop to that resumption? No, we have not. Uh, we have not. And each case will it's be... It's contact and well, it's open. Yes, but if you look at football, actually, you know, uh, it is not uh, a, a sport like maybe wrestling, uh, where you have close contact or like boxing or judo. But it is. 
It is. No, well, it is because well, you have to tackle to get the ball. Well, you pass. I can't but, allow you go because I fear so, for COVID nineteen. So and I allow done, you go to score. So you see, these measures we take. So there is no absolute measure. Whatever we are doing is to try to mitigate and to balance between public health and also, you know, uh, either the economy or the livelihood of, of mm. people. So for that reason, uh, the other sports are done indoors, you know, and therefore, you know, it is in a confined space, and therefore you have, um, you know, higher chances of transmission of, of uh, uh, this, these infections. So each case will be treated on its own merit. If you take football, for example, what of the spectators? You have people who are sitting in the stadium, uh, are they congested? Is there social distancing? Uh, how about going into the stadium, the entrance? And the these are the things that states should take into consideration before they put on their own uh, guidelines uh, regarding these restrictions. And you know, all of these will amount to mere talk if there is no enforcement. The truth is that Nigerians are unlikely to do a lot of these of their own volition. So what is government doing this time to ensure maximum compliance? So one of the uh, steps we have taken is to engage the state governors. Um, today we had a very fruitful meeting with the uh, FCT minister. Uh, and we urge all of them, you know, to roll out their enforcement uh, teams. Um, and the enforcement, just the way it was done during the, the second wave, um, is going to be systematic. We are going to look out for public places, ensure that they comply, ensure that they have temperature checks at the entrance, ensure that people entering this or utilizing these public buildings are wearing their nose mask. Uh, also ensuring that, you know, there is no congestion at any point within these uh, public spaces. So the enforcement is an important aspect and we have seen, uh, you know, the state leadership also carrying on with this responsibility. The FCT has taken up uh, the responsibility. They have already announced that their task team should continue, enforcement should commence, and they have already provided some guidelines uh, regarding the upcoming Eid prayer, uh, you know, in, in, in the FCT. We've also seen River State uh, taking up, you know, uh, the measures, going on extra mile to extend the period of the curfew, uh, you know, in his own state. And many other state governors have also called in We've had very uh, fruitful and frank discussion regarding the, you know, pros and cons of these regulations. And they are all eager and ready, you know, to implement for the welfare of their own people. Are there exceptions to these rules? And I ask because some essential duty workers are made to work through the wee hours of the night. And most times they have run-ins with uh, security agents. How will such people be protected? And I talk in reference or with reference uh, to hospital health workers, sometimes the media. Yeah, so certainly for every rule there is an exception and this is not uh, a new thing. Even when we had a total lockdown in this country, um, we had essential workers, uh, you know, moving about doing their businesses. They have their identification and um, the enforcement teams or the security agents, you know, uh, always allow them uh, to pass through, uh, you know, through these uh, uh, restrictions or make their, their movement. Um, apart from the essential workers, you also have uh, exceptions. Uh, for example, if you have your flight, uh, by British Airways, you have to leave by 7 a.m. So it means you will be in the airport maybe by before 4 a.m., you know. So all these are genuine exceptions that have been taken into consideration. And there are also other exceptions. Uh, for example, a government agency, uh, you know, is trying to conduct promotion examination for, you know, their, their staff. You know, so and they have to be more than 50, whatever. So the right to request for the waiver from appropriate authority.